On today's episode, NASA has a new problem with the Artemis moon mission. We set sail on the solar winds. A new lunar landing is on the books. Inflatable space habitats are blowing up. And this week's video is brought to you by the Space Race Newsletter. Check it out today. Just when you thought that NASA's Artemis moon landing operations couldn't possibly get any more complicated, from the massively expensive and outdated SLS launcher, to the massively massive and complex Starship lander, to the totally non-existent Gateway Space Station, now we're hearing that of all things, it is the launch tower that's going to ruin everything. How did that happen? Well, in yet another of their famous Cost Plus contract awards, NASA's builder of the Mobile Launcher 2 has somehow allowed the project cost to balloon up to six times the original quoted price. And even worse than that, these construction problems could put the first crewed landing on the moon in jeopardy. The Mobile Launcher Platform is a piece of hardware that NASA has been using since the 1960s. It allows the technicians to stack a large complex rocket system like the Saturn V, the Space Shuttle, and the SLS, and then integrate that rocket with the launch tower while all of the components are still safely inside the vertical assembly building. So when it's all ready to go, they just slowly wheel the whole mobile platform over to the launch pad. NASA built three of these rigs for the Apollo program in the 1960s, which were then repurposed for space shuttle operations in the 80s. Between 2009 and 2010, a fourth platform was constructed. This is Mobile Launcher 1. It was hardware designed to support the George W. Bush era Constellation program, which was a moon to Mars exploration project very similar to what Artemis is today. Constellation was cancelled in 2010, but it left behind this one launch tower and a couple of design concepts for a big rocket and a deep space crew capsule. That original Ares rocket design would become the Space Launch System, and the Mobile Launcher 1 would be retrofit to support the new rocket. But SLS is already a bigger vehicle than the launch tower was originally designed to handle, so while NASA has been able to make do with the initial Block 1 configuration of SLS, in order to upgrade the rocket to its much needed Block 1B, they are going to need an entirely new mobile launcher to accompany it. ML2 is going to support the new exploration upper stage of the SLS, which is a bigger, more powerful propulsion system that will allow the Orion capsule to carry both a crew and a cargo payload into lunar orbit. The ML2 tower would need relocated access and egress arms for crew transport into the taller rocket. It also needs a more substantial vehicle damper system to stabilize the new rocket system against high winds and vibration from transport. Additionally to that, the umbilical connections need to support more propellant transfer for the exploration stage's larger hydrogen and oxygen tanks. On top of all that, the ML2 just needs to be much beefier than the current ML1, which wasn't designed to handle the power of the SLS. And we saw that after the first launch of Artemis 1. The launch tower systems were pretty badly damaged by the force of the rocket. Plumbing was shredded, doors were blown off, nothing that couldn't be fixed, but it was far from ideal. Even still, ML1 is good enough to last up to and including Artemis 3, but following that, ML2 is essential to the continuation of the moon landing program, so that's why it's important and why we should be pretty concerned about this new drama that's unfolding right now. The original plan was for NASA to grant one contract for the design and construction of ML2. This was awarded in 2019 to a contractor called Bechtel Engineering. It's a very old American company that was founded in 1898 and is still family run to this day. NASA agreed to a cost plus funding model with an estimated project cost of $383 million and a delivery timeline of March 2023. Of course, it would end up costing much more than $383 million and the launcher is still nowhere near ready. That's pretty much expected when it comes to spaceflight, but the scale of this particular cost overrun has become pretty mind boggling. In 2022, a NASA Inspector General report found that the cost had already risen to $916 million, with a projection to reach $1.5 billion at completion in 2026. So that's pretty bad. 
but a subsequent independent review conducted by NASA later determined that the real cost would be $2.1 billion and the actual delivery date wouldn't come until at least January of 2028. Now, in the most recent report from NASA's Inspector General released on August 27th, they put the estimated cost at reaching $2.5 billion by 2027. That would be six and a half times the original value of the contract when it was awarded five years ago. The report states, quote, Our projections are based on the substantial cost growth that the Bechtel contract has occurred over the last three years. Past performance issues observed during design with the production of detailed drawings for steel fabrication and management of the launcher's weight, and the significant amount of construction work that remains. For the record, NASA officials have disagreed with the inspector's conclusions. They say that it's unfair to use a straight line extrapolation of Bechtel's costs, basically saying that just because the numbers are skyrocketing right now, doesn't mean that that trend will continue as construction moves forward. Which is fair to say, I guess, but it also highlights the fact that pretty much all Bechtel has done so far is design the launcher. There has not really been any meaningful progress on the actual construction. So to think that this will somehow get cheaper once the hard work really begins, it's all a bit comical. Anyway, the report concluded that the overall cost of ML2 is likely to reach $2.7 billion. That's after NASA completes their own work of installing the umbilical arm connections and all of the plumbing systems. This has the potential to become an existential threat to the entire Artemis program, because NASA has such a limited amount of money to work with here. Its fiscal year 2025 budget request projected spending $415 million on EGS development projects between 2025 and 2027. This is the category that includes ML2, and it's also already a 72% increase from the 2024 budget request. And that would still not be sufficient funding to cover the OIG's projected cost of ML2 development in that same time span. So NASA would end up with a budget shortfall of nearly $400 million just on this project alone. And that's just the launch tower. It was supposed to be the easy part. The actual SLS Block 1B rocket is also in a total shambles over at Boeing right now. We've talked about that already though, so sad to say the future of the Artemis program has never looked dimmer than it does right now. Here's some good news for you. After four months in space, a solar sailing spacecraft has successfully spread its wings above our planet. This is NASA's Advanced Composite Solar Sail System, and it was launched in April on a Rocket Lab Electron vehicle that deployed the payload at an altitude of 1,000 kilometers. On August 29th, NASA confirmed that the vehicle had successfully hoisted its sail and is ready for testing. The solar sail has a surface of 80 square meters, about half the size of a tennis court, and now that it's fully extended, you might be able to spot a new square floating through space with the right telescope at the right time. During the next few weeks, the team will be testing the maneuvering capabilities of the sail in space by raising and lowering the orbit of the spacecraft. This will provide valuable information that may help guide future concepts of operations and designs for solar sail equipped science and exploration vehicles. Just like the wind that propels a sailboat, it only takes a small amount of sunlight to guide solar sails through space. Photons themselves don't have mass, but they can still force momentum when they hit an object. That's what a solar sail takes advantage of. It's been thought that solar sail equipped probes, such as the Breakthrough Starshot, are the best chance we have at reaching other star systems within any reasonable amount of time. NASA has selected intuitive machines to deliver a set of payloads to the South Pole region of the moon in 2027. This is the first award under the CLIPS program in nearly a year and a half. The new mission is valued at $117 million and will employ the Nova Sea Lander to deliver six payloads with a combined mass of 79 kilograms. The six payloads in question, four from NASA centers, one from the European Space Agency, and one from the University of Colorado Boulder's Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics. These include biology, planetary science, and space science experiments, as well as a laser retroflector array. 
the ESA payload named Package for Resource Observation and In Situ Prospecting for Exploration, Characterization, and Testing, or Prospect, will drill a meter below the surface to study any volatiles like water ice that may exist below the surface. This award is the fourth that Intuitive Machines has received, more than any other company that is part of the CLIPS contract. Astrobotic and Firefly Aerospace have each won two task orders apiece. Intuitive Machines has been the only one of the group so far to reach the surface of the moon, although their lander unfortunately touched down in much more of a horizontal orientation than expected, it's still much better of a result than Astrobotics, whose Peregrine lander malfunctioned in low Earth orbit and ended up burning up in the atmosphere. There are two more CLIPS launches scheduled for later this year. Intuitive Machines IM-2 mission and Firefly's Blue Ghost 1. Firefly announced August 26 that Blue Ghost had arrived at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for environmental testing ahead of a launch in the fourth quarter of this year. Intuitive Machines executives said on an August 13th earnings call that the company was targeting December or early January for the launch of IM-2. There is a new player in the field of inflatable space habitats. Actually, much more like an old player with a new game. This is the Lockheed Martin Inflatable Airlock Module. The aerospace and weapons manufacturer has been testing their new soft goods module in the hills of Waterton Canyon, Colorado. Their first prototype was put through multiple gas-in, gas-out cycles, essentially inflations and deflations with enough nitrogen gas to pressurize the airlock to the point where it becomes as rigid as steel. Lockheed technicians say that they've also been conducting burst tests with the Vectran shelled prototypes as well. So this is all pretty similar stuff to what we've already seen over at Sierra Space. Only Sierra is a bit further ahead with their testing and have already moved on to full-scale, habitat-sized modules. Inflatables are looking to become a very competitive market in the coming years. After the original concept was proven by Bigelow Aerospace with their inflatable module on the ISS, that company folded in 2020 but left wide open a new market opportunity. We've also seen Colorado startup Max Space enter the inflatable market with their very own small-scale prototype that's set to launch as early as 2025 on a SpaceX rideshare mission.